Happy Halloween, and welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are looking at the 10th installment of our annual Halloween special, where we're going to be looking at today, what is the paradox of bum, 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 suspense. Now... The paradox of suspense is a paradox of fiction, similar to the paradox of horror that we covered last year. Check out our video on that if you're curious. Simply put, the paradox of suspense is a paradox for how people can feel suspense when they are aware of what is going to happen in a work of fiction. Someone that rewatches their favorite suspenseful movie or rereads their favorite thriller novel seems to feel suspense, even if they remember exactly what is going to happen. Now, suspense seems to be a state where we don't know what is going to happen. It has often been described as a combination of uncertainty, hope, and fear. Being in suspense leaves you uncertain if you should be hopeful for a positive outcome or fearful of a negative outcome. But uncertainty between those potential outcomes and those intentional, potential emotions seems to be a, an essential component of it. It seems like it would be strange to claim that you were in suspense about something that you are sure is going to happen. Uncertainty seems to be a crucial part of suspense. But this leads to a paradox for suspenseful fiction. Sometimes the paradox is framed in terms of a trilemma. A trilemma, for anyone that's forgotten, is three statements, all of which seem intuitive but can't all be held at the same time. So the first statement, remembering the conclusion of a story, means you are not uncertain about the conclusion. Premise two, uncertainty is a necessary component of suspense. And premise three, people feel suspense in scenarios where they can remember the conclusion of a story. All of these seem intuitive. It seems like you can't be uncertain if you remember what will happen. It seems like uncertainty is a key component of suspense. And it seems like people honestly feel suspense even when they rewatch fiction and remember what is going to happen in the story. Now, there are several ways that philosophers have responded to this trilemma. We're going to look at seven. Two, that deny the first premise, the compartmentalized forgetting theory and the specificity theory. Four, that deny the second premise, the thought theory, the desire frustration theory, the empathy theory, and the subconscious theory. And one, that denies the third premise, the emotional misidentification theory. Let's take a look. So, compartmentalized forgetting, or sometimes moment-to-moment -moment forgetting, denies the first claim, arguing that you can be uncertain even if you remember the conclusion. There are a couple of ways that different theorists around this do this, but it often is explained through reference to evolutionary psychology. One way of explaining this is, in nature, while humans may encounter many situations that appear similar on face value, we are always uncertain if they will turn out the same. There are no situations in nature where we can really be certain the, the exact same results are going to happen. We did not evolve a means of processing events that will certainly be the same every time, like the plot of a book or a movie. So we are uncertain, even though we remember the ending, because our cognitive architecture prevents us from being certain that things will turn out the same, even if we remembered how they turned out last time. We compartmentalize the memory as only a possible outcome because we've evolved to think of that only as a possible outcome and always be a little bit skeptical. Our brains force us to doubt and therefore be slightly uncertain even when we remember what will happen. And that slight amount of uncertainty is enough to get us to suspense. Now, there's some concerns with this view. One is the fact that suspense can actually increase upon rewatching a film because you see all of the hints at the conclusion earlier. You see the character you remember will turn evil having lunch with the protagonist, and you get that feeling of suspense because you remember what will happen. And you didn't have that feeling of suspense on the initial watching of the movie. If we have some uncertainty that things will turn out the same, we should be less suspense, you should, we should feel less suspense in these moments, not more. If we have uncertainty, things will turn out the same way. We should not be worried when we are aware of what is going to happen. This awareness seems to, though, increase suspense, counter to what the compartmentalized theory would have us think. 
A second response denies the first premise in a different way, and claims that we do not and cannot remember all of the details of a particular event. So while we may not be in suspense about what exactly is going to happen, we are in suspense about how it will happen. You might remember that there is a jump scare coming, but not remember exactly when. You may remember that a particular person is the killer, but not remember exactly how they did it. This addresses the suspense in rewatch concern from the last theory, since you might be in suspense about all of the hints that were left that you didn't notice or remember the first time you watched the film, but you have uncertainty about them now. You discovered at the end of your first watching who was the killer, and now you're rewatching, and you have suspense about all of the hints and uncertainty certainty about all of the hints that were left earlier. But you may be in less suspense overall since you remember the broad strokes. Remembering the conclusion on this view is not sufficient to negate the impacts of uncertainty about the details. One might be concerned with this view for several reasons. It seems that even very short films, where it's easier to remember all the details, can provide substantial rewatch value, and you still feel suspense when watching them. Additionally, we seem to feel suspense about the things we remember happening. You rarely forget the biggest suspenseful scene in the movie, but it would be odd to no longer find that scene suspenseful simply because you remember it well, and to find smaller scenes that you may have forgotten more suspenseful. A third response relies on the thought theory of emotional processing, or the entertained uncertainty theory. This theory denies the second premise, claiming that entertained uncertainty is what is required for suspense. Basically what this is saying is we are not actually being uncertain, we are suspending disbelief when we're engaging with fiction and setting aside our preconceived ideas about the way the world works and certainty and even our recollections from the last time and only obtaining entertained uncertainty. And this kind of intellectual imaginative exercise allows us to separate our beliefs and memories of the last time we read this from or watched it from the actual experience of doing it again. In other words, you're not actually uncertain about the outcome, but you imagine that it is possible. You use your imagination to separate your actual memories from your uh, suspending disbelief and putting yourself inside this fictional world. You imagine that anything could happen, even though you remember what actually happens. A similar response could be made to the paradox of horror, that we are not really experiencing fear, but rather imagining the feeling of fear, and therefore it is enjoyable because we're imagining the feeling as opposed to actually experiencing it. However, there are objections to this view as well. It seems like if all that's required to have suspense is imagined uncertainty, there seems to be no reason to be in less suspense if you're spoiled about the ending of the film, because you can just suspend disbelief and put yourself in this imaginary space. But people seem to be really unhappy about being spoiled about the ending of a film. While people seem to feel some suspense while re-watching a movie, it seems like they often feel less when they're watching it a second time, or at least are feeling it in different places as we talked about before, with the hints at the, the twist at the end. If all that was needed was, the, was for the imagination required for watching any fiction to separate yourself from this, it seems like we should get the same amount of suspension, this feeling of suspension on the rewatch, because we're just as able to uh, suspend all of our preconceived ideas. But we do seem to have less suspense or feel suspense in different places. A fourth response, the desire frustration theory, argues that suspense is not driven by uncertainty, but by the inability to impact the outcome of a future event. You don't feel suspense because you don't know what's going to happen. You feel suspense because you can't do anything about it. You're held in suspense when you're waiting to hear back about getting a job, not because you don't know the result, but because you can't impact the result. Similarly, even when you are aware of what will happen in a movie, you are not able to impact the results, and so you feel held in suspense. You want to yell at the characters that there's someone behind you, but you can't impact their behavior. You can't impact the result, and so that's the feeling of suspense that's going on. We're most in suspense when we cannot warn the characters on screen of what is about to happen to them, not because we're uncertain about it, but because we cannot help them. We have a desire to help them, and that desire is frustrated, hence the name desire frustration. One set of concerns with this viewpoint is that scenarios often seem suspenseful, even if it's the villains who need to be warned of impending harm. If the hero is sneaking up on the villain, you still get a little bit of that sense of suspense in it, even if you 
are the outcome you desire to happen is what's going to happen, and you don't want to change the outcome of what's about to happen in, on screen. When an antagonist plan is about to be thwarted, it seems like we feel suspense, even if we have no desire to change the outcome. Conversely, there do seem to be media, such as video games, where we can feel suspense despite being able to impact the outcomes of the game or the particular battle. Check out, there are so many horror video games where it really seems like people feel a sense of suspense despite being able to have real tangible impacts on at least certain aspects of what's going to happen in the game. In that case, suspense seems to draw from clearly uncertainty, not really lack of control. And desire frustration may actually be identifying a different feeling that people are experiencing when watching these kinds of movies, which is the lack of control piece, but suspense itself may be capturing something very different that does rely on uncertainty. A fifth response is the empathy theory, which claims that you are not feeling suspense on your own behalf, but rather are empathizing with the suspense felt by the characters on screen or in the book. You may remember the ending of the story, but they are oblivious to it every time, and so you feel suspense because you empathize with their situation. In the same way that you might cry or you might cry at a movie not because you're personally sad, but because you empathize with the pain of another on screen, even if that person is completely fictional, you might feel suspense because the characters are uncertain, not because you are. And that uncertainty is drawn from the characters, even if you personally don't have that uncertainty. Now, you might dispute this theory as it seems like there are some suspenseful situations in fiction where there are no people involved at all to empathize with. You might watch a giant set of dominoes falling and feel suspension about whether or not they will all work, despite there being no person on screen for you to empathize with. Now, one might respond that you're actually empathizing with an imagined person, i.e. the person that set up the dominoes or the person that's filming the video, etc. So even in this situation, you might feel suspense without a real character to empathize with. But as with desire frustration, you might also be concerned that viewers are actually empathizing with a villain, but seem to be in suspense. People seem to feel suspense even if it's the villain's plot that's about to completely unravel, and even if they wouldn't really say that they were empathizing with that villain. A sixth response offered to this paradox is the subconscious response. Basically, this response claims that many components of suspense are subconscious. I can be held in suspense by a piece of music. I can feel suspense through a certain kind of lighting in a room that hides certain corners of that room or simply feels ominous. These types of suspense do not require a specific belief of not knowing what is going to happen next or being uncertain, but rather the subconscious emotional triggers that lead to one feeling suspense without a propositional attitude. If you see an establishing shot of a creepy cabin that has many things around it that would lead you to feeling suspense, I'm skeptical that you're actually forming beliefs about all of those individual components of what the uh, set designers have put in there. Rather, it seems like you are getting that subconscious level of suspense and fear and anticipation regardless, without forming any specific propositional attitudes, and often with things and components that you may not remember were in that scene previously or be able to identify or talk about intelligently afterward. In fact, I doubt many people are that are engaged in watching a thriller take the time to think hard about what will happen next. If it's a good thriller that's truly suspenseful, you're more likely to be caught up in the action. Feeling suspense because of the subconscious cues that are provided by the design of the movie or book, not because of reflexive logic or belief. Many seem to react emotionally and then retroactively fill in beliefs after the fact. If conscious belief is not a component of suspense, then uncertainty doesn't need to be a crucial component of it either, because uncertainty seems to be about beliefs, not about feelings. We feel suspense not from forming some belief, I don't know what is going to happen, but rather from a general emotional state that combines fear and hope and doesn't necessarily require uncertainty. Now, one might be concerned that this view does not offer a sufficiently robust definition of suspense. However, if it is a subconscious phenomenon, then it may not admit of a definition in terms of beliefs and desires. Further, one might be concerned that while this might work for the paradox of intense moments of suspense in periods of action, it doesn't provide for suspense over longer periods, such as a mystery throughout a movie or while reading a book that might take days. One might respond that those kinds of suspense really do not occur upon rewatching. You might feel suspense in the moment, but on the rewatch, you don't have the same feeling of trying to puzzle through a longer mystery as you do on the initial viewing or 
reading. You aren't trying to figure out who the killer is in the same way. You're sus feeling, feeling suspense about more of those immediate, sudden moments as opposed to that broader story because you do remember the components of that broader storyline. The final response we will look at denies the final premise, that people who remember the ending are actually feeling suspense. Under this theory, people are misidentifying the feeling of anticipation, i.e. the feeling of anticipating what they remember will happen, with suspense. So they're mistaking anticipation for suspense. They felt suspense the first time they watched it, but now that they remember what's going to happen, they're actually feeling anticipation. Anticipation doesn't require uncertainty in the same way as suspense does, but it's otherwise similar, so it might be mistaken for it. Under this view, you can either be someone that has honestly forgotten what will happen, and so are experiencing real suspense, or you're someone that remembers and is mistaking your anticipation for suspense. But if you remember what has happened, you cannot be in suspense. We might raise several objections to this view. First, one might argue that anticipation has more of a positive spin to it than this view allows. It seems like you anticipate good things that will happen, but you dread bad things that will happen. I can anticipate a good meal, but it seems to make more sense to say that I'm dreading my execution tomorrow than to say I'm anticipating it. Dread, however, doesn't seem to be the emotion that's being confused with suspense here. We don't seem to dread to rewatch movies because we dread seeing scary or bad things happen to people. We seem to get some amount of enjoyment out of it, in fact. Yet, if anticipation has a positive spin, it doesn't seem like we are really anticipating those scary or negative things either. The best emotional state to describe our feeling towards those events seems to be suspense even if that's suspense that lacks uncertainty. What do you think? Which of these views best explains your experience of suspense when re-watching a film or rereading a book? It might be multiple of these views. These views are not necessarily conflicting. You might deny all three of the premises here. Or do you think there's another theory that's a better explanation or resolution of this paradox. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Happy Halloween! Watch this video and more here at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.